in the short term, and when I talk short term, I'm talking even five, 10 years yes. where work is still seen as part of self-identity and worth and value in our economy and in our society. I'm conscious of being the old man shaking his fist at change, right? Because at the advent of computers and the advent of every new technology, people are like, oh my God, this is going to just destroy all work everywhere and we need to struggle and fight against it. But I think in the case of AI, that might actually be true. The demand destruction for labor might be so exhaustive and rapid that society's ability to digest and create new opportunities for work or to slide up Maslow's hierarchy of needs may actually be itself disrupted. And that, that's kind of scary to me. There's a bunch of Palestinian militants whose stated goal is the eradication of Israel. Bad, 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 stupid, 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 never going to happen. And then the stated position of Israel is two-state solution or we want to coexist or we want to find a way for peace. Yeah. There's a the problem with that. If you want to know what's in someone's heart, you just look at their actions, not look at their words. The actions are they're slowly but surely leveling homes and eroding the available land. But it's no longer just actions. The most recent interview that I saw with Netanyahu was... Oh, yeah, the two-state solution is not really viable. The piece of land is too small. Basically, we have to be in control of the whole land. Yeah. And so he basically said there is never going to be a Palestinian state, and we don't believe in a two-state solution either. No, I, I know. So what's the end game? I, I, don't, I don't think they're going actual, like, you know, Nazi-style genocide, which means you've got a lot of Palestinians. Like, literally, what are you going to do with them? You concentrate them. It comes a powder keg. They attack. There's no end game. No founder, obviously, is born an incredible founder. Every new business that you start requires different things from you and the company. And so some of your muscle memory may not apply, even if you've been successful before. And even then, as you say, you can't read the label from inside the bottle. I like that metaphor. I'll often find myself giving advice to founders. I will later realize that I myself am not following. And then I'm like, holy shit, Chris, you talk about this all the time. Why is it so hard to see it for yourself? And it's not because I'm a hypocrite. It's not because I'm making this stuff up. It's because I'm in the weeds of my own problems. You're human. I'm human, yeah. And I'm often fond of telling the founders that I'm working with, some of my advice is because I've done this before. Some of this advice is because I'm clever at this particular domain. A lot of this advice is just because I have emotional and tactical distance from the problem. And I'm like a drone hovering above the forest and I can tell you which way is north. What have they done that's unsafe so far? We don't know. Well, here's the thing that some people thought that this was the result of them having discovered AGI and freaking out. But there were recently, I think in the last two weeks, people tweeting out of the company going, three times I've been in the room where we have pushed the veil of ignorance back and it just happened again. And people are speculating like, what the hell did he just see? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what is going on back there? And how fast are they going to ship it? So uh, we don't know. We don't know what they've cooked up back there. So in the work I do with tech companies, we'll start by talking about if you didn't exist, what would the prospect do? And that's often things that don't look anything like you. Well, I'd use a spreadsheet or I'd have an intern do it or I'd do it by pen and paper, by hand, as well as things that look like me. And so we'll map that out and then we'll be like, okay, well, what have you got that they don't have? And then how does that translate to value? Therefore, who cares a lot about that? Therefore, what's the market you win? So that's how you do it. So all of this really suggests that founders don't do positioning for one of two broad reasons. One is they don't know about it or how to do it. And the other is they don't want to do it because it limits hedging and optionality. It makes right. them feel uncomfortably constrained. What those founders don't understand, what those investors don't understand, it reminds me of this saying, do you believe a small group of passionate people can change the world? Well, it's the only thing that ever has. It's like, do you believe you can make a massive impact by starting with an embarrassingly narrow positioning statement? Maybe it's not the only thing that ever has, but it's like one of the surest ways to do it.
And it reminds me of Peter Thiel's Zero to One, where it's like you want to become a monopoly in an embarrassingly narrow niche, and then you grow from there. You land and expand. We used to talk about content as king. Well, now content is free. And so what happens next? Is it back to the question of attention as king or maybe providence is king? The data. Or authenticity is king? Jeremiah, you're saying data in order to train these models. But I think if you're a company, then proprietary data is king. But as an end user experience problem, I think providence and authenticity starts to become a real concern. Like, is this made by human or is this made by computer? Is this real photo of Trump being arrested or is this a made up photo? Is this a real thing that Biden said or is this made up? That to me seems like the democracy breaking question of the time. You don't send the contract out the next day. You do it the minute of. And when you've got nine different plates spinning in the air because you've got to do that to be in a place like New York, you just keep things moving. I think because things happen at a different pace, it builds momentum. And the best way to build a great business and one with thousands of employees and billions of dollars in revenue is momentum. I think the environment is conducive for that. And it's much easier when everyone else is kind of operating on that wavelength. I have mixed feelings about it because I believe Google and Apple earned monopolies through innovation and through good products. They just were the best and they proliferated. But on the other hand, you feel some of the power they wield is so massive and their ability to excise rents, therefore, is really powerful. But I don't know what the right answer is because, okay, they have to let third party apps. So that means all the work they did, you're letting someone else just ride on that. And whatever security risk they bring to the table, you have to deal with it. So I feel like it's a problem, but I'm not sure what the answer is to it. This is true of a lot of tech companies and a lot of debates about tech companies where they've created effective solutions to painful problems, solutions that are habit forming, that drive retention, solutions that have network effects that get better with more usage, effective rails that connect users to value and developers and ecosystems to users, which did not exist before. Very often I will be advising companies or companies will approach me for advisory. They'll say some version of Sally's doing a bad job. Sally's a product manager and our product management team, Chris, they suck. Now the truth is their team may suck, but more often than not, what's happening is that Sally is telling everybody, hey guys, we have a lack of context. We have a lack of principles. We have a lack of resources. You're asking me to do too much. And what John and Tom and Harry are saying is, Sally, you're making excuses. Sally, we don't believe you. Sally, you're asking for too much additional context and strategy. Sally, who do you think you are basically the salesperson is going hey sally is not getting all the features built we want her to build she's terrible we need a better sally and the marketing team is like sally's not giving us what we want and the ceo is like why is sally going so slowly and it's like because sally is fucking drowning guess what sally told me she's been telling you the same problem over and over again and you're not listening and you took you to hire me a high-paid outside advisor to tell you sally is right